Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Killer Interview Strategies, Finding Facts for Your Fiction. Uh, it is 6 a.m. here in Los Angeles, so get your coffee brewing, and we're going to dive into research, experts, and interviews. My name is TJ Berry, and I am an author, podcaster, and I am also your pandemic cruise director. So seriously, if you need recommendations for virtual mu museum tours or live stream comedy shows, um, things like online conferences, like Flights of Foundry, um, trivia games that you can play remotely, or even some like fun pandemic snacks, hit me up because uh, I've been doing this for 65 days in lockdown. Uh, I used to run the website and the blog of former presidential candidate Howard Dean back in the day when screaming could get you disqualified from a presidential race. Um, I also owned a bakery that specialized in hand decorated sugar cookies. And when I was really young, my dad made me work in his razor blade factory until they kept having to reset the days without an accident to zero. And then he said, you know what? You can go work at Fashion Bug instead. So that's the best way to get out of the job. Um, I've also written two queer space offer novels that mash up fantasy and science fiction. Uh, you'll see one at the top, Space Unicorn Blues, and the sequel is under it, Five Unicorn Flush. I also have a handful of horror and comedy short stories at places like Toasted Cake and Kaleidotrope and Pseudopod. Um, so before we start, let's go to the next, Ooh, back, there we go. Before we start, if you have questions, um, you can pop them into the Aramis channel on Discord. Um, I might not be able to see them during the conversation, but um, I'll try to save time for them at the end. Um, and also I will give you the URL for the slideshow at the end of the talk. So, um, you know, you don't need to scramble to write anything down. I'll, I'll give you the, the link to this slideshow. So let's jump right into this. What should I research? The short answer is Guns and Horses. Fun fact, that was the original name of the band Guns and Roses. People who like guns know their guns. People who like horses know their horses. The long answer, what you need to research, is everything. So. Let's start with horses. I once had a reader email me everything wrong that I'd done with horses in my novel. He was so angry. He said, have you ever spent time around horses? He shouted at me in all caps. Now, listen, I was writing about talking astronaut unicorns uh, with, fighting with space fairies, and he just could not suspend his belief about his, my horse anatomy facts. So with the horse people, Either get it right or be prepared to hear that you are wrong forever. Research is a fractal. So as for the long answer of what you can research, it is everything. Research, the deeper you go, the more tiny branches of detail you'll find. Like say you start out reaching, re researching a long haul trucking story, right? And then you discover this entire subculture that's built around truck, truck stop etiquette. And then you learn there's this hotly contested dessert called Nanner Nanner Pudding that every truck stop in Eastern Kentucky claims to have invented. So each of these truck stops has a plausible sounding story about the woman who created Nanner Nanner Pudding, which leads to all these other wonderful histories of women who came to own truck stops in Eastern Kentucky. It's incredibly fascinating, but it's probably not germane to your buddy cop road trip story. You might just wanna have a trucker off to the side, ordering a bowl of nanner nanner pudding and leave it at that. With, and that adds true life color to a scene without giving a full explanation. Because your job as a writer is to know when to stop researching and to start writing. There are two pitfalls to watch out for when researching. You get so enamored with the incredible facts that you find that you put them all into your story and then you bore your reader because they know you're showing off. And number two, researching is not writing. Anything that takes away from your writing is taking away precious writing time. Yep. Here we go. So what things must you absolutely get right? So if you don't want to end up down a, a Wikipedia rabbit hole, but if you want to get your facts straight, what topics should be your priority for getting right? No matter how technical or scientific your, your book or story is, you should always start by getting the following things right. 
culture, race, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, mental health, chronic conditions, and this is not an exhaustive list. So these are just places to start to make sure that you're getting things correct. So why is this list more important than say like fuel consumption on the way to Mars? Because these topics involve real people who exist in our world. A good question to ask yourself when you are writing and when you're researching is, if I get this wrong, will someone be harmed? So if your math on a fictional moon trajectory, like is pictured on the slide, is incorrect, most readers won't even notice. You'll get a few people who say, hey, that's not correct. But if you carelessly use a harmful stereotype or you dead name a trans character or you demonize a very common mental illness, readers who have those lived experiences could be hurt by your work. And readers who don't share those experiences may learn that it's okay to perpetuate those harmful tropes and language. So make sure that you get your physics and engineering right, but you have to get your people right too. So how do you find an expert? You're saying, okay, TJ, I want my book to be as well-researched and robust as possible, but I need help. How do I get this information? So the good news is experts generally want to talk to you, especially if they find out you are writing a book on their subject. In all of my time in writing books and stories, I have never had a person refuse to talk to me. And here are the reasons why. Number one, be specific. Know exactly what you need before you start contacting experts. Study enough about the subject on your own so that you don't waste the time of an astrophysicist when who you really needed was a specialist in astrodynamics. You know, most times you'll be able to find the factual data on your own so that when you get to the expert part, all you need is a few minutes of time. When I finally did some spend some time with a horse expert after getting a few emails about my horse facts that were wrong, um, she was able to give me really good anecdotal stories about how horses showed their moods which was I was able to incorporate into the story instead of factual data about horse bones and joints. What, what that person complaining about my horse facts was looking for was not exactly facts about horse bones. What they were looking for was something that felt a little true to life with my horses, even though they were spacefaring unicorns. So what you're looking for is that sparkly little detail that you can put into your story that rings true and sticks in readers' minds. You're not just looking for dry facts and equations because you can just find those online. So number two, go local. If you have a question about Mars and you try to contact Elon Musk, I guarantee you're not gonna get a call back. But if you email the professor at a local state university who wrote a really great Wired article on Mars habitats, that person is more likely to wanna to share information with you. And they'll probably be very excited that someone read their article and wants to talk with them about it. So think of all the people around you in your local area who have granular expertise that you don't share. And these don't have to be professors and scientists. These could be a dog groomer who has expertise on calming wiggly puppies. I mean, it could be a, a grocery store clerk who knows exactly how many items have to go in the bag. And you could put that little detail in the story of one of your characters who happens to be bagging things and obsesses about the numbers. Um, maybe it's a local radio DJ who knows how to operate the soundboard at the station or a local fireman who can tell you about how being on call is a mix of boredom and adrenaline. It's those little details that can give you a slice of life that makes your story resonate with your readers. So you can also ask friends of friends. I have a friend who happens to be acquainted with a handful of astronauts. And knowing our tiny little speculative fiction community, you might even be able to guess who that person is. Anyway, one day in passing, she introduced me to an astronaut she happened to be hanging out with at that moment. And he was somebody who was on the International Space Station. And in the course of our natural conversation, hi, nice to meet you, um, I was able to ask him a couple of questions about his time in space. I did not have to set up a big two hour interview because I had already done step one and honed down to the most important pieces of information that I wanted to find out, should I ever meet him someday? And it happened on a street corner. And in that moment with just two casual questions, 
I was able to get a couple of critical details from my story. It happened spontaneously, but because I knew what I wanted, I was able to just say, hey, how does this work in space? And he was delighted to tell me the interaction took no more than three minutes. So be prepared because you never know what kind of research opportunities will pop up for you. So find free resources. Many years ago, I wrote a book that was a pictorial history of five tiny little island towns in northern Vermont. And so I contacted the Vermont Historical Society and I said, do you happen to have any images of these five towns? And they said, we have thousands and you're welcome to take them. They are high resolution, print ready images. And the only thing you need to do to have them is credit them to us in your book which was amazing because I had been spending my time going to garages and attics of people all throughout the towns looking for photographs that I could scan. And here, <clears throat> excuse me, this organization was handing to them to me on CD. I didn't even have to go and sift through them. They had an online archive and they said, take what you want. We really don't need anything other than credit. So there are a lot of nonprofit organizations out there like library collections, historical societies, private organizations, um, things like fraternal organizations. You can ask Lions, um, you can ask uh, Masons and Order of the Eastern Star. These are organizations that have a lot of photographs and a lot of history and a lot of documents. They may be willing to share with you. And so that makes your job that much easier. Number five, do not forget about YouTube and online classes. So there are so many incredible talks and interviews on YouTube. You do not need to interview the expert if they are either being interviewed already or if they are giving a TED talk or some other kind of presentation. You can get all of the information you need right there. The top picture here is Janine Driver. She has a fantastic TED talk on reading body language. Um, and below her is a former FBI hostage nego negotiator named Chris Voss, who gives information not just on body language, but on negotiating. I mean, he negotiated for people's lives, so he understands how to teach you how to negotiate for a better price on a used car. You can really learn anything on YouTube. There are experts in lock picking, there are plumbers, um, there are experts in magic, and they are happy to put their information on YouTube. And these resources are again, freely available to anyone with an internet connection, you should use them. So what kind of experts are there? So there are subject matter experts, and these are scientists and people who have specialization in the field, like the two people I just showed you on the previous slide. Um, there are also lived experience experts. So these are people like people who grew up in Bangalore, or parents of triplets. These are people who lived an experience that is different than you, um, that you would not understand what it's like. What is it like to be parents of triplets? Well, a lot of us don't know that, and we don't understand what the challenges are. And you know, to be honest, I'm not quite sure how you tell apart three babies who look identical. So I'm not sure if you like put a bracelet on them or if you're a parent, you can just tell. Those are things that you want to ask the lived experience experts. And finally, there are sensitivity readers. These are people who have a marginalization and that they share with a character that you're writing. So this could be like a disability, this could be a, a mental health condition. Um, these are people who can do the same as lived experience experts, but they're doing it in something that, that uh, is a marginaliza marginalization that you don't have experience with. And these are also people who you should consider paying for their expertise. So what kind of things can you ask uh, an expert to do? Um, you could ask an expert to just have a general conversation with you. This is when you email a, a local expert in fisheries and you say, can we sit down for 30 minutes over coffee? And I'd like to talk to you about the challenges of farm salmon. And you have a general idea of where you're going and a set of questions. Um, but the general discussion can actually go in many different directions. So um, you take your time and you, you meet with them. Uh, they can also do fact checking. So this is you saying to them, I'm coming to you with a list of facts and I would like you to gut check them for me. So in the fisheries example, you're saying, you know, uh, 
fisheries, uh, farming salmon is 365 days a year, so you don't get any vacation days. And the person says, oh, well, actually, you know, we do three days on, two days off, you know, and then, you know, those other couple of days, um, you know, kind of rotate throughout the month. Those are some little details that might help if you're writing a character that works at a fishery and you need to know, you know, how many days are they going to be working? How much time do they have off to bury a body? Another thing that they can help you with is excerpt reading. So this is something less than a chapter usually. You can send it to them and say, hey, this is a chapter about a dog groomer and I wanted you to just read it for me and let me know if it sounds like it's ringing true to you. What details am I missing? What's your biggest challenge during the day? And then there's a full reading. So this is you are handing your manuscript to an expert of some sort and they are doing a full reading. Now, if you are doing this, you should really be figuring out a way to compensate your reader because this is a big job. Just think how much time it takes you to read a book in general and now layer on top of it that they are reading and making notes and hopefully giving you some detailed feedback. So this is something where, you know, if you can, you will pay a person, but if you can't pay in money, perhaps you can negotiate a critique swap, perhaps you can negotiate, you know, I'll make a, a, a huge multi-course dinner for you, um, but just understand how much work it takes to read and critique someone's work, especially on an expertise level, um, that this is not something you should really ask people to do for free. So you've asked your expert, what can, what can you help me with? I, I have this information about, you know, greenhouse workers in my story and you're a greenhouse worker. So how do you prepare for talking to them? You know, you've asked that local expert for their time, they said yes, and you're about to go to the interview. How do you make sure that you are ready? So first you're going to want to make a prioritized list of what you need. So you can't get through your allotted time and then realize that you haven't asked the big questions. Um, start with the big rocks first. And I'm not sure everybody has heard that story. So if you can see the image there, if you start with a jar and you fill it with sand and then pebbles and then rocks, it will overflow and not everything will fit. But if you start with the big rocks first, which are the most important things that you need, then you nestle the pebbles between the big rocks and then pour the sand between the spaces, it all works. So you start with the biggest, most important things first, and then you move to the things that it would be nice to have. So how can you get ready and make sure that you know, know everything you need to know before you walk into that room? Um, you need to know as much as you can about both the expert and their field. So it's really not enough to just go on Wikipedia and be like, okay, well, this, this person is an expert in, you know, uh, biology on other planets. You really should know a little bit about the person you're speaking to because there may be some neat intersection that you could use in your work. So this person may be a horticulturist uh, in their private life and be working on interesting hybrids in their backyard. But if you don't know to ask about that, it might not come up in the conversation. So there's a wealth of information that you could potentially be missing. Um, and you also don't wanna focus on the basics. So this is something we talked about before. You don't wanna spend the time asking a physicist to explain basic physics, physics to you because you can get that information elsewhere. You're kind of wasting your time and theirs because you can find that in a, in a, a YouTube video or maybe a Khan Academy video. Um, what you want is to ask this person things like, hey, I've got time travel in my novel. Is there a way I can use quantum entanglement to enable that time travel so that I can have a time heist in my novel? You know, you don't wanna go back to the basics like how does physics work? Um, you should also have a plan. So take, the, the uh, things that you have researched and say, what are the things that are most important for my story and put those in order and start with those. Just like we said with the big rocks, um, you can even write out a script in case you freeze. There is nothing wrong with going to an expert and reading straight from your page and saying, okay, I have all these questions. I'm just gonna read them from here. It would be great if you can have a conversation, but if you can't, if you're nervous, um, if, if it's too difficult to do in the moment, it's totally fine to read from your script. 
it's better to have something come out and, and go than to just be sitting there going, Ugh, I don't really know what to do. Um, and then eventually, if you start to read from your script, the conversation might end up flowing. And then the third part is be ready to deviate from your plan because some of the best stories you will ever hear are the ones that you are totally not expecting. So don't be too fast to hustle your expert back into information gathering mode. If they meander off onto a tangent, let them because you might actually end up at a place that has better rewards than straight q and A. I I once spoke to an expert who started talking about this intense rivalry with himself and the other scientists in his lab and that was totally more interesting than the part about the grass seeds that he was studying. So those are things that you could put into a story. Adding a detail about how to you know, put a grass seed under the microscope is not as interesting as adding a little back channel politics into your scientific lab. So what makes a great interview? So personally, your marker of success could be one of several things. Um, to come away with some details and flavor that adds authenticity to your work. You know, we talked a little bit about nanner nanner pudding. That is an actual thing that I heard about on a podcast called Over the Road. Over the Road is a podcast for um, long haul truck drivers. Well, it is about long haul truck drivers. It's not really for them because they know all this stuff already. Um, so you can find that anywhere where you get your podcasts. I would highly recommend it because it shows a lot of information in this fractal format that you would not have even understood was there. So I understood there were long haul truckers and that, you know, they got in the truck and maybe didn't come home for three days. But I did not understand uh, things like there are sometimes rivalries between local truck stops about who has better food and who has better services. Um, I didn't know these really rich and interesting stories about how truck stops were passed down through generations of family and how certain truckers only go to certain truck stops because that's where their favorite people were or their favorite foods were. Um, I did not know that there is a huge contingent of, of growing Punjabi truckers in America and that um, they are very vocal about protesting uh, these laws that make uh, electronic monitoring standard on trucks. Um, apparently, truckers have these devices in their trucks that make sure that they stop whenever their time has run out on their, on their allotted shift. And these devices can, can make it so that they have to stop in a dangerous area. Whereas before they could use their best judgment and say, I'm out of time, but if it's 10 more minutes, I can get to this really great truck stop down the road. Now they can't do that anymore. So you can see how, as you start to go down and down into this information, um, it, it expands all of these tiny details. So you may have once had a story about a space trucker and now you have a story about a space trucker who's trying to beat the clock because his timer is going to run out and it's going to shut down his spaceship in between two planets. So another thing that's a marker of success of a great interview is to leave with an expert level understanding of a topic on your own. So you've already done the research, you know about the basics of the topic, um, you know, you go in there and perhaps you get a really great expert who is able to give you such a fantastic detailed overview of what their job is like that, that you sit there and you start to be able to put yourself into their shoes. I mean, it could be something as simple as the example of a dog groomer. You know, you start to get a, a feel for, there's this one dog every day who is a, an absolute pain in the rear and she comes in every day and she wiggles around and she chews up the leash and her mom, her dog mom thinks she's fantastic. So I have to put on a smile and every day be like, yes, you know, Muffy is so wonderful where she's wreaking havoc in the back room. And, you know, but the woman gives me a $10 tip every time. And so it's worth it for me to pretend because that $10 pays for a really great lunch that day. So instead of McDonald's, I can get Panera. So those are the little details that are really going to stick in your reader's minds and they're going to feel true because they are true. And then, you know, one of the other things that makes a great interview is if you come away with ideas, how to fit that topic into your story more seamlessly. So for example, you have a time travel story and you're like, I know I want to put some hand wavium in there. So you want to put some jargon in there that you're not sure how it's going to sound 
um, but you want it to sound real. And then all of a sudden you sit down with a physicist and they're like, oh no, this could theoretically work. And so you find jargon that fits and that sounds correct, um, you know, that you would not have done on your own. And sometimes the, the, the flip side of that is you end up with an expert and they give you the real jargon and it doesn't sound as good as the fake jargon. And in those cases, you can choose to make the distinction and say, uh, I'm going to take some artistic liberty and I know that I might hear from some people, but it's really cool to say the words quantum entanglement, even though the actual thing is, you know, sideways connectivity, because I'd like to have that feel to my story that makes it sound a little more science fictional. And that is totally okay. As long as you are making the decision um, intentionally, you could do that. So the reason I have these two people pictured here is because these are two great interviewers. One is Chris Hardwick on the right, and he is from the Nerdist podcast. You probably have also seen him as the host of Talking Dead. Um, he also, I'm trying to think, he did um, At Midnight, which was a nerd trivia game show. So his area of expertise is all things nerd, especially pop culture. Um, he is a tremendous expert on the subject, and because he knows his stuff, when he sits down with people who are within or adjacent to nerd culture and geek culture, um, he is able to ask really nuanced and pointed questions because he knows all the different areas that we can go down. So, so he might have a director on, say he, he brings on like the director of a, uh, a Batman movie. He knows the Batman movies inside out and he can say, why did you make the choice to go grayscale in this scene as opposed to previous directors, which have, have you know, made the pearls hit the ground at the time of Batman's parents' death? You know, you chose to show that off screen. And he knows enough about the subject matter that he can get really detailed and nuanced. And that is something that audience members enjoy. Instead of hearing the rote questions, you know, why did you choose to, to uh, make Batman surly instead of comedic. Um, he can get really granular and people will learn things they have not heard before. Um, so listen to his interviews. You can find them on Nerdist, uh, the podcast. Um, and there are certain shows that are interviews and certain ones that are just the host bantering. What you're going to want to look for are the interviews. Um, and listen to the kinds of questions he asks in order to get people to open up. He also does a trick where he makes people feel very comfortable um, he doesn't ask them questions that would make them feel backed into a corner or defensive. And because of that, people feel comfortable opening up to him. Um, he also takes a moment to connect with guests. Um, usually it's just from his friendliness and from showing them that they know he knows their subject matter. So this is something that you can do if you sit down with an expert and you say, I've been reading up about grocery bagging and it says that there's this 12 item rule where you have to get 12 items into a bag. Is that really hard? You know, showing that the person you're speaking to that you have done a little bit of research and, um, you know, know a bit about their world kind of extends a hand. It's, it's a little bit of a bridge. Like, I don't disdain your job. I know it's probably interesting. And I know there's probably things about it that are difficult. You know, my tip to you, and this is, this is something that works in conversations and meeting people everywhere, is that everyone thinks their job is hard. Regardless of what they do, they think it is hard. So one time I was at a Christmas party for, uh, for a, uh, a company and I met someone's spouse and she was a runway model. And I have no idea what it's like to be a runway model. And this, this you know, she was kind of standoffish with me. I, you know, we didn't really know each other. It was an awkward like spouses talking conversation. And I happened to just blurt out, gosh, that sounds so hard. And her face just lit up and she's like, it really is hard. And no one had ever told her that her job was hard. People think runway model, oh, that's totally easy. You show up, you put some clothes on, you walk down a runway, you walk back, you're done. You get paid a lot of money. But for her, there were aspects of the job that were hard. So if you acknowledge that there is skill involved, that there is difficulty involved, that goes a long way to making whomever you're speaking to feel like they have been seen, that you know it, 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 their job is not something that you're simply dismissing. And another thing Chris Hardwick does is he is willing to go off onto a tangent when it's more interesting than the original line of questioning. 
Um, so one of the things that I heard on one of his interviews is uh, around the time of the interview, his father had passed away and um, he was trying to connect with the guest whose father had also passed away recently. And he got a sense for the situation. They, they were kind of, you know, not kind of in a, a state of grief where it was too difficult to talk about. It was at the state of grief where both of them were kind of ruefully joking about it. And he said, I guess we're both members of the Dead Dad Club, which in some instances could have been inappropriate. But because he has a really good sense of the person he's talking to, um, the other person laughed and said, yeah, that's a, it's a rough club to be a part of. And they connected. And it made the interview so much better because there was a, a thread of understanding between the two of them. Just, but just by saying that little three word phrase that we share this set of experiences and we come from the same place. And the rest of the time, the, the interviewee was able to share anything because they had this connection with Chris. And on the left, we have another great interviewer. And he is a lot more polarizing because he does not always use his interview power for good. And on the left, this is Howard Stern. Um, he talks about a lot of topics that make people uncomfortable, but one thing that he does do is that he tends to ask leading questions to his guests to try to get them open up. So that was their leading questions and their open-ended questions. So he may ask somebody about the most traumatic time in their life, which makes both them and us uncomfortable, but then he'll say something like, that must have made you feel terrible, didn't it? Didn't you want, you, do you want to just go up and punch that guy? So the guest has a choice. They can say, yes, I did want to go up and punch that guy. And, and it was really hard to feel that way, but I didn't punch him. Or they can say, no, I'm not like that. I'm kind of a pacifist. And both of those give Howard Stern the opportunity to open up the questions in a new direction. You're a pacifist. So do you feel like, you know, throughout your life, you try to avoid conflict? Um, and he also does share about himself in the same way that Chris Hardwick does. You know, he'll, he'll say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with keeping things tidy. And then a guest will say, yeah, me too. Um, so connecting with people and asking open-ended questions, um, you know, so you can do what Howard Stern does, but you can do it without the part that makes people uncomfortable in more of a Chris Hardwick way, you know, kind of gentler things like, so, wow, it must have been really hard when your mom left your family and joined the circus. You know, ask people about things in an open-ended way and give them an opportunity to tell you a story. So you've got your prioritized list and that's up at the top. Um, but what are some like technical things that you might want to also ask? So you can ask things like, may I record this interview? Um, you should always ask. And if a person says no, and that is within their right, they do not need to be recorded, um, make sure you have a backup plan. Perhaps you wanna take notes or you can't take notes in the moment because it's not your style or you can't write in that moment, but you leave and you immediately go sit in your car and write down everything you remember. What I don't recommend is saying, everything in that interview was so fascinating. I will definitely remember it when I get home because you will often not remember. That is like waking up for a dream and the dream is extremely vivid. And then 20 minutes later, you're downstairs making a bagel going, oh gosh, that dream had something to do with corn chips and now I can't remember it. So if you do not have time or the means to write down your information within the interview, as soon as possible, get to a quiet spot and capture as much as possible, even if it is just a phrase that you can remember, um, because the second part of that is ask if you can follow up and fact check. So, you know, if you write down something like, um, you know, garam masala, and you're like, I don't know what I meant there. If you have asked, is it okay if I follow up the email, if I have any questions, then you can email and say, hey, I wrote down garam masala here in my notes. Can you, can you remember what we were talking about at that moment? And there is nothing wrong with doing that. It is better to double check than to get something wrong. Um, I had to do this at one point and it specifically had to do with, with spices um, because uh, I had a subject matter expert. I was looking to write for Space Unicorn Blues what it was like to be a scientist working on a space program in Bangalore. So what I did was took out to dinner a couple from who had grown up in Bangalore and had moved to the United States. And we went out to dinner and sat and I had my little notebook and I asked them a lot of questions, but we were also eating at the same time. So it was very hard to get all of my notes down at the moment. So I did the same thing. I wrote down things like, 
garam masala. And I was like, what did I write that down for? So later I contacted uh, Shruti and I said, I am so sorry. I wrote this down and I did not recall what I asked you. And she said, oh, you asked me what spices I would take on a generation ship. And I said, oh, thank you so much. That's perfect. So just make sure that you can follow up. And then you can also ask, is there anything I've missed? Um, is there anything you wish people knew about your subject? Are there any fun, bizarre things that happen that people just don't even know about? You know, if you ask, you might end up with a really good story. You, you, what you're looking for is to be friendly and conversational, but professional. Um, and this is something that many of you probably won't need to know, but I do because I have a bit of a truck driver mouth. Um, watch your swearing. If you're in the habit of using salty language, you do not want somebody to shut down during an interview because you used a word that they're uncomfortable with. So uh, as I tell people many times, if you are unsure of what the person defaults to, default to language that you would use in front of a kindergartner. Um, you know, I have trouble with that sometimes, but I'm getting better. <laughs> also, don't underestimate big jobs. Um, I know of a writer who applied for access to a special collection at a library and she got there and realized it was so much information, she couldn't absorb it all in one appointment and there were no appointments available for months. And that left piles and piles of documents untouched. Um, and she, to this day, laments that she was not able to get through all the documents. So if you're going to look at a special collection, ask how much material there is before you go. It could be a, a single folder. It could be boxes of folders. Um, ask if you'll be able to make future appointments because maybe you can spread this out over a week or a year. Um, you can also ask if photography is permitted or scanning. Um, some places will say, yeah, you can scan what you want. Well, you can come and borrow a quick scanner and go through and just let the, the documents run and examine them later. I have done that before when I've done historical books where I have an hour and I'm running out of time and I just start using my phone and snapping photographs with permission of the documents so that I, I can look at it later. And also don't push past your allotted time. You know, be respectful of the time people have chosen to share with you. And even though I mentioned connecting with people, this is not the time to share lengthy stories about yourself. This is about the other person. So how much research should you put into your story? Well, the author of the novel Quietus, Tristan Palmgren, told me about this extensive research project he did to figure out the right type of clothing his characters would be wearing in 14th century Italy. And after weeks and weeks of research, he boiled it down to two words in the book, the Flemish jacket. And there's a picture of a Flemish jacket. <laughs> you know, research is like salt. You want to have it in there for flavor, but too much, in, it overshadows the entire dish. And when do you not need to research? So if the story itself is strong enough to withstand the scrutiny of the science, um, your work is bizarre enough that the reader has to, has to suspend disbelief, you could probably skip on the research. You know, in the first instance, no one is going to notice the type of knife your character uses if they're sobbing that your main character is dying. Um, if they can engage with the action or the relationships or the prose, you can distract them with a little bit of hand wavy them here and there. Um, you can also choose to lean in the direction of pure ridiculousness. In my first book, Space Unicorn Blues, the spaceships are powered by unicorn horn. And I mentioned that early in the story, and that is my signal to the reader that they needn't search for the science behind any of this. The science of the magic is irrelevant, and I want you to focus on the relationships. So you can fudge a lot of things if you do it with confidence. Sorry for interrupting, 10 minutes. Perfect timing. So this is the moment we've been waiting for. It is officially question time. If you have questions about research, you can ask me. But if you have questions about other things too, this is your opportunity. I have a lot of opinions about things and, and I don't have a problem to share them. I've been kind of keeping an eye on the Discord off to the side. Um, so I've seen the little the little characters. Um, I, I agree, Sid, you know, um, adding research makes pe more believable characters, you know, Different people will react differently to the same situation. Someone who works with cattle every day at a ranch is not gonna worry when a 700 pound bull comes charging at them. Um, you know, what they, what they will do is know exactly how to get out of the way or someone who works at a, um, a rodeo, like as a rodeo clown will know what to do. Whereas you or I might panic and freeze and get injured. 
So how will your different characters react in different ways? Research will tell you that. So if anybody has questions, you can pop them in the Discord. I can, I can see it off to the side. Um, Dusk mentions for anybody who's not on the Discord, um, at Archives, my father uses his phone and a note-taking pro program that has built-in OCR to get through lots of documents. Yeah, absolutely. As long as you ask permission and you say, can I scan or otherwise photograph these documents? That is totally fine. Um, I, and sometimes, in some instances, not generally archives, you may take some of the documents home. Uh, when I was working on that uh, Lake Champlain Islands book for uh, the Vermont towns, um, there was one woman who said, oh, I have a few photographs from the 1950s if you'd like to look. And I arrived and there were boxes and boxes because I did not ask, how many photographs do you have? And so I started scanning them with her and I said, I am sorry, this is so much great information. Would it be okay if I took them home with me? And I did, I took them home and that way I had days instead of minutes. Um, question, are there ever times when you have to pay attention to legal rights and how you use your research? Um, that is a great question. And I always pay attention to legal rights. Um, unless it's a conversation where you're talking with somebody, um, usually they will tell you, this is proprietary information. I am giving it to you as background. Do not use it. Don't ever use it. And make a note in there. Um, perhaps you have a different pen. Write it in red pen. Do not use. But it's something that you can keep in mind that, that you may not be able to officially put in your text. Um, so things like if you're talking to an elected official and they say, well, we had a closed session and I'm really not supposed to share what happened, but the vote was unanimous. Well, you cannot use that factual information because that closed session is uh, officially private. Um, but what you can do is construct a situation where the closed session is unanimous in your story and change some of the details. Um, the Lake Champlain Islands book again, the historical society said, you know, we own the copyright of these images. You're absolutely welcome to use them. Each one has to be credited with this exact wording. So in that situation, you know, they're not going to sue you, but you don't want to run afoul of the Vermont Histo Historical Society who has done all this work for you. Um, things that you might want to watch out for, though, is um, if you are saying something about someone that is not true, um, that could be slanderous or defamatory. So you need to be careful that if you are saying, uh, you know, perhaps somebody had some sexual misadventures and they are a real person, um, be very careful. You can either ensure with citations that the information is true or because then they can't sue you, you know, the, the information is, they could, but you would win because the information is true or you can disguise it so much that it is not reasonable for a person to assume that you are talking about them. So look for like law and order. So law and order does this a lot where they will change the facts of a law case that currently exists. And you say, oh, this sounds kind of like the Harvey Weinstein thing, but they don't use his name and they disguise some of the facts. So that protects them from lawsuits. So that's a way in which research, um, you, you can make sure that you are protected. Uh, question, can you give an example Five of how- minutes, to, by the way. Thank you. Um, can you give an example of how to use research without risking info dumping? So, you know, this goes back to the SALT slide. I honestly try to use research as little as possible as facts in the text. I try to use it as background information. So if you take your research and you know all about this 15th century town, you know, it may not be useful to spend three pages describing the town, but what you can say is, you know, there were sacks of limes in the marketplace, or, you know, the city had started to replace cobblestones with an, an, an ingenious new way of paving, which made Sarah, our new character, have a much easier time walking on the cobblestones. You know, what you wanna do is use it in service of the story because story is always the number one consideration. Um, do you have any tips for interviewing people, not for their expertise, but their lived experience? Questions to ask to tease out life story, motivation, insight, past decisions, hindsight. Great question. Um, in that case, I would try very much to get to know the person in some sort of um, acquaintance way before you start. What you're looking for is somebody feeling like they can open up and those tangents are going to be your main focus. So listen for words 
that explain when perhaps there was conflict, when there was transition in their life, um, when they had to make a decision. And as long as you are polite, you may ask people about traumatic events. Um, if somebody mentions offhandedly, yeah, this was when this terrible event happened to me, you can say, would it be okay if I asked you about that and respect their decision. But many people who have experienced traumatic events would like to share about that. Um, and and if, if you say, that sounds really difficult, would it be okay if I asked about that? And they say, yeah, most people don't ask me about what it was like. And if they seem to get uncomfortable, you can check in with them again and say, is this line of questioning still okay with you? If it's not, that's totally fine. So what you're looking for is a very personal uh, exploration of things. So, you know, be polite and be respectful of boundaries, but don't be afraid to ask because people are generally very forthcoming. Um, we have a tendency of, of humans to shy away from difficult conversations. And you, as the interviewer and researcher, you are looking for those difficult conversations because that is where good stories lie. So get in a good habit of turning to people and saying, is it okay if we go there? Is it okay if you tell me what you were feeling in that moment? Were you terrified? You can even lead them a little bit, like we talked about. Were you, were you scared? Were you angry? You know, why, why were you so angry instead of scared when this person showed up at an, with a, a knife at your, at your book reading? Um, you know, what happened before that? So you can definitely ask these things um, and then you may get some incredible stories. Uh, any tips for email interviews? Um, you know, they're good in a pinch, but I feel like you miss a lot because you are missing the body cues that tell you there are really good stories there. Um, you are missing the opportunity to follow up easily. And people tend to think of email as very business-like, so they kind of dash off a reply. And then you're sitting there going, you know, oh, I really didn't get what I needed. Now I need three more emails to do it. If that's the only venue that's open to you for whatever reason, it's better than nothing. So if you have, you know, a, an expert and you're like, well, I really kind of need to um, ask you this, that's totally fine. But I prefer in person. It gives you a really good opportunity to get new stuff. Um, all right. I think we are just about ready to go. And so if you would like to connect with me online, you are welcome to. I'm on Twitter, at T. Jane Berry. I use Twitter extensively, so you're always welcome to follow and say hello. I'm on Instagram, at T. J. Berry Writes, And my website is also tjberrywrites.com. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see the link to this slideshow. It is bit.ly, so a regular bit.ly link, killer interviews. And then you'll be able to find all of the stuff that I talked about here. Um, thank you so much for coming. It was super fun to talk to you today, and I hope to see you later.